Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. I am delighted to introduce Meredith Holgerson. Meredith is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology here at Cornell. Uh, she's been here since uh, 2020. I almost said 2000 and added 20 years since 2020. Um, before that, she was an assistant professor at St. Olaf College. After finishing a postdoctoral uh, uh, fellowship with the US Geological Survey, she has an undergraduate degree in environmental science and biology from Denison, a master's from our friends up the street at SUNY in, uh, College for Environmental, Science, uh, for Environmental Science and Forestry and a PhD from Yale. Uh, the research in her lab covers many things, but most of them are wet, involving wetlands and ponds and lakes, uh, studying wetland, pond and lake ecology. Uh, with a particular emphasis on the role of these systems in producing uh, and sequest producing greenhouse gases and sometimes sequestering carbon and trying to figure out their next balance, uh, for which she'll tell us about these things today. Please take it ahead, take it away. Thank you for having me. Um, it was fun to think a little bigger. Um, I am going to provide an overview of how ponds, lakes, wetlands play a role in global carbon budgets. And because I know there's a diverse audience here and some of you have probably seen this graph many times and others of you are hoping for a refresher, I'm gonna start with some basics about carbon cycling and carbon accounting and how we make these big global carbon budgets work. And so what we can see here, let's see, I'm gonna get my laser. I don't have an actual laser, so I'm gonna use the computer's one. We have atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations on the y-axis tracked continuously through time at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii from 1958 to today. And so we can see that our carbon dioxide concentrations are increasing and that before the Industrial Revolution, which isn't plotted here, concentrations were around 280 parts per million, and now they're one and a half times greater than that. We can scale even further back to look at the past 800,000 years and we can see these regular cycles where we have dips and peaks in carbon dioxide concentrations, but nowhere over the last 800,000 years has it gone above the 300,000 parts per million line until 1911, right? And so with the industrial revolution and the burning of fossil fuels, these emissions have increased and they're accumulating in our atmosphere, right? And so we have 1958 concentrations and today we're over 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so if I was asked you to come up with the sources, I know you would all shout out fossil fuels as the biggest source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. What I'm gonna walk you through are the sources and the sinks for carbon dioxide. And so over here, this will populate. And what you're looking at is a y-axis here in gigatons of carbon. It's also the same as petagrams of carbon. I'm gonna move between those units based off of different graphics that I'm showing today. And we can see that nine and a half gigatons of carbon are emitted from fossil fuels each year. So what I'm gonna be showing you is on an annual basis. All right. A lesser known one is the 1.1 gigatons of carbon per year that's emitted from land use change. This is largely the conversion of forests to agriculture, right? We're cutting down those trees that are storing a lot of carbon, a lot of carbon that's also stored in the soils that's being emitted during that land use conversion. The question is, what happens to all of this carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere? The first big sink that we'll talk about is called the land carbon sink. And that's our vegetation, mostly forests that are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that's actually been able, we've been able to increase that a little bit. So carbon dioxide, as we're adding that to the atmosphere and as the atmosphere is warming, the vegetation on the planet can take up more carbon dioxide and they're taking up about 3.1 gigatons of carbon per year. Although it's uncertain how much that will be able to increase as we continue to pump CO2 into the atmosphere. There's also the ocean carbon sink. So many of us think about the ocean as taking up carbon dioxide. It's the flip side of that is ocean acidification, right? As we increase the amount of CO2 that's being absorbed by the ocean, we see that it's getting more acidic. So the land carbon sink and the ocean carbon sink each take up between a quarter to almost a third of the CO2 that is emitted to the atmosphere. And the rest ends up being taken up in the atmosphere, increasing those concentrations, contributing to that keeling curve of the increased carbon dioxide concentrations through time. 
if you're looking at that and seeing, oh, we're, this is zero and, and now this bar is going below zero, that's a budgetary imbalance. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that imbalance today. That imbalance is about 0.3 gigatons of carbon. And it, it means that one of these sinks or all of these sinks are a little off. And so we have an accounting problem. And if we look at the global carbon dioxide emissions through time, we can see our fossil fuel carbon, right? Increasing as we're emitting fossil fuels to the atmosphere. Land use change also contributing CO2 to the atmosphere. Again, you can see the units have changed here now. We're in gigatons of carbon dioxide instead of carbon, but kind of same values if we were to convert back to carbon. Then we've got our ocean sink, our land sink that's been increasing through time, and then the remainder that ends up accumulating in the atmosphere. What I want to draw your attention to is that light gray line in the background. It's being hidden a little bit where this laser pointer is. So sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't. That's the budgetary imbalance. Sometimes our budgets overestimate and underestimate those sinks of what's happening to the carbon. And so again, this is an accounting problem. And if we look through time at the different carbon budgets that have been estimated through time from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s up to today, we have the emissions and then we have the estimates of the sinks, and then we have the balance. And so what you can see here is that the balance, that imbalance, it differs both if, in terms of if it's positive or negative, it also differs in magnitude. So again, this is some sort of an accounting problem. We'll talk a little bit about these models um, and how they work, but they're not perfect. And some would argue that this imbalanced budget could partly be explained by inland waters. And so some argue that the imbalance of, overestimated, of overestimating that land carbon sink, this green one, and that's because the terrestrial landscape, there's a lot of carbon fluxes happening there, but we also know that sediment and leaf litter and carbon particles move from our terrestrial landscapes down slope, right, with water. So the water that make up our streams and our rivers, they transport carbon. And they're transporting carbon to our lakes and our ponds further downstream, ultimately ending up in the ocean. And these inland waters can process and transform that carbon with implications for the global carbon budget. But for a long time, they were excluded from these budgets. So what I'm showing you here is I want to draw your attention to this pipe. And this was the way that inland waters were historically viewed in the global carbon budget. They were viewed as taking 0.9 petagrams of carbon, in this case, per year, and then going through our streams, our rivers, our lakes, our reservoirs, and emptying out into the ocean. The same 0.9 petagrams of carbon coming in are coming out. It's a passive pipe. And you can see that if you squint at this diagram, where you can see 0.4 petagrams of carbon coming from the land and 0.8 petagrams of carbon coming from weathering entering this stream, there's no lakes or wetlands or ponds on this map, just entering this pipe of a river and entering 0.8 petagrams into the ocean. So this figure has 0.8 coming in and 0.8 coming out. And this is a different paper and it has 0.9 going in, 0.9 coming out. Regardless, they're viewing this as a pipe, shunting carbon from the land to the ocean with inland waters not processing that carbon at all. All right. So John Cole and others published this paper in 2007 saying that inland waters are not a pipe. They're not passively transporting carbon from one place to the other without actively transforming the carbon, processing the carbon, potentially sequestering the carbon. And this is a diagram that they put forward was that we have inland waters that does shunt 0.9 petagrams of carbon to the ocean, but also stores 0.23 petagrams of carbon in sediments each year and emits 0.75 petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere through carbon dioxide or methane emissions, right? And so these were the first estimates to say, whoa, wait a minute, who are missing this key component on the landscape that could be transforming carbon? The only way to make that budget now balance is to increase the amount that must be coming from land, right? So you can see this 0.9 petagrams of carbon here has changed to 1.9 petagrams down here. So we've added a whole petagram of carbon, basically subtracting it from the land carbon sink, saying that this is now coming off the land into the water. And so it, it again is an accounting problem. It's requiring increasing the amount of carbon coming from the land 
reducing that land carbon sink to make the budget work. And then in our next IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change puts together these reports, puts together these figures that it's really hard for you to read all those numbers. But what I wanna highlight is there's still this stream, there's still weathering from rocks coming into the stream, and now there's export from soils to the river of 1.7 petagrams. Remember that was 0.4 in um, the 2007 report. And now we have a lake and we have some carbon burial from the lake at 0.2 petagrams of carbon. And we have one petagram of carbon that they're saying is coming out of those lakes and inland waters and entering the atmosphere. And we still have 0.9 petagrams of carbon entering the ocean. So now we're seeing this active role that inland waters can have in, included in these budgets with some numbers associated with them. The last 10 years, I guess it's been 11 years now since that report came out, there's been a lot of research to put bounds on these numbers to figure out, is it really one? Is it actually two? What's the carbon burial? What are these emissions? These numbers are hugely uncertain. And so this is the time frame where I went and went and got my PhD and started thinking about some of these questions and the roles that inland waters could have on the carbon budget. And so up until now, I've kind of described to you what, what people are thinking about for carbon dioxide. But we also know that methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas, right? It's the second most important greenhouse gas behind CO2. It has a stronger warming potential than carbon dioxide. So every molecule of methane has a 30 times stronger potency of how much it can warm the planet compared to carbon dioxide on a 100 year time scale. 87 times stronger if you're just thinking about a 20 year time horizon. And similar to carbon dioxide, those emissions are rising. So you can see over the last 2000 years, these emissions rising, we're now at three times greater methane concentrations in the atmosphere than where we were at the beginning of the industrial revolution. And the methane cycle is really important when we consider waters and wet places on the landscape. So if we zoom here to look at the, the sources and the sinks of methane, when you look at this pink are human sources of methane and the blue are these natural sources of methane. And so you can see Similar to carbon dioxide, fossil fuels are a big source of methane to the atmosphere. That's this bar right here. We also see landfills, rice cultivation, livestock, burning of biomass. But then if we look at these really big bars over here, those are our fresh waters and our wetlands. And it's a little bit odd, but wetlands are treated differently than inland waters in all of these budgets. So there's a wetlands group and they do their own modeling. And there's an inland waters group, which is where I sit and we do our own modeling. And the inland waters includes rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, reservoirs, and the wetlands are more of the vegetated things that the open water people ignore. Um, so that's why they're, they're highlighted as two bars, but you can see that both of those are really huge sources of methane to the atmosphere. The lighter colors that are fringing them, stick with this laser pointer here, that's the uncertainty. And so it, it might be that big or it might be just the, the size of the darker shade in between. There's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, all right, so fresh waters and wetlands can create a lot of methane. And then the sinks for methane include bacteria and archaea that can break down methane, convert it to carbon dioxide, as well as a lot of atmospheric chemical reactions with radical hydroxyls that I'm not gonna get into today. All right. When we talk about the accounting for the methane cycle, we're even in more trouble than carbon dioxide in terms of imbalances. We're struggling to bound these numbers of methane emissions at a global scale. And so I wanna quickly talk about these two terms, bottom up, versus top down. When we're modeling carbon at a global scale, you can do it from the bottom up. And the bottom up means that we're going out to lakes and ponds and reservoirs and farms, and we're making these measurements on the ground. We're saying, this is how much methane a cow produces, or this is how much methane this pond is producing. And then we look around the world and we say, okay, there's this many cows on the planet, or there's this many ponds on the planet. They make up this amount of surface area and we can extrapolate upwards to say, this is how much this type of ecosystem or habitat or species is contributing to methane emissions. That's in contrast to top-down atmospheric modeling, where we're looking at what's happening in the atmosphere 
and then we're downscaling what must be happening on the Earth. Now, we want those two things to match up. We want our top-down models and our bottom-up models to kind of match, and then we can both say, these are the sources, and this is what the atmosphere is seeing. But what you can see from these numbers is our sources are too high from the bottom up, and our sinks are too high from the bottom up than what the atmosphere is seeing. And the imbalance for the bottom up models with between the sources and the sinks is much more dramatic than the imbalance that's happening from these top down models. And so this is really a big question of, of why. Like what is going on? Why can't we balance our budget, right? It asks the same thing in social realms right now too. So there's a large discrepancy for wetlands and inland waters. These are not the only discrepancies. There's lots of literature kind of debating where these sources and sinks are coming from. Um, but you can see these error bars, again, are really large for the inland waters. I would also say that as someone that's contributed to these numbers, we're a little bit more honest with our uncertainty than some of the other categories. So fossil fuels, for instance, this is based off of what fossil fuel companies are reporting to their nations versus the scientists in the room that kind of always have caveats about our uncertainty. But regardless, there are some pretty big uncertainties that we're grappling with. And so the question is, can inland waters help balance the budget or do they further complicate the budget pointing fingers saying this other, these other factors must be wrong? And so that's sort of the question that I'm gonna try to tackle a little bit today. And so we know if we're saying that we have this import to the, to the inland waters. That's basically a reflection of what we can measure with our gas fluxes, what we can measure enters the ocean, and what we can measure is at the bottom of our lakes, ponds, and wetlands. So the export term is assumed to be 0.95 petagrams of carbon per year. And this number has not changed very much in the last 40 years. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but it really hasn't been changing to the same scale that carbon storage and our gas flux terms have been changing. Our carbon storage term is somewhere between 0.1 to 0.4 petagrams of carbon based off of different papers that have been written. And I'll come back to this towards the end of my talk today. Gas fluxes, somewhere between three quarters to 3.8 petagrams of carbon. This is a huge number that, that we're ranging here. So those gas fluxes are really uncertain. And then that import term is going to be adding up these other terms, adding up the gas flux, the burial, and the export. So a few things to note. If we increase our greenhouse gas emission term, which is what we keep doing with every new study we do, or we increase how much carbon is being stored in inland waters, that's going to require increasing our import, which right now that means reducing our terrestrial sink. For methane, we also really need to consider the fact that our Bottom-up estimates are much greater than our top-down estimates, and our sources are also much greater than our sinks. So we probably have overestimates somewhere in those models. All right, so that brings me to the research questions I'm gonna talk with you about today. The first question is, to what extent do these inland waters matter in the global greenhouse gas budgets? The second question is, what's driving these greenhouse gas emissions from inland waters? And the third question is, how much carbon is being sequestered by these inland waters and also by wetlands. With the ultimate goal of thinking, can we help constrain these huge uncertainties in these global carbon budgets that matter if we're gonna make ad adequate predictions, that matter if we wanna think about managing these emissions in some way. So again, I already mentioned this, that streams and rivers, lakes and ponds, as well as impounded waters like reservoirs are kind of clustered together for inland waters and thought about separately than wetlands. My research program mostly focuses on lakes and ponds, so that's where a lot of today's work is going to talk about, although I'll come back to wetlands towards the end of the talk. So if you're thinking about a lake or a pond, I've now told you that carbon dioxide and methane are coming out of these systems. How, how does that get produced? What's happening inside these water bodies? So what you can see here is I have decomposition and I put some leaves here. So that's kind of a nice, nice visual. It doesn't have to just be leaves. It can be the decomposing plants, decomposing algae, decomposing fish. Everything kind of sinks to the bottom of a lake or a pond and it gets broken down there at the bottom, the muck that you feel between your toes as you're walking into a lake to take a swim. That decomposition starts off with our heterotrophic bacteria that break down this organic matter, 
use oxygen, produce carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide can get taken up by phytoplankton or other plants in a water body, and it can also be exchanged with the atmosphere through diffusion. That diffusion is the movement of gases from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Typically our inland waters end up super saturated with carbon dioxide, so it's moving from our lake or our pond into the atmosphere. Now, because that process uses up oxygen, we end up with anoxia. That means low or no oxygen in our sediments and even in bottom waters of lakes and ponds. When we get to that point where there's not a lot of oxygen, those heterotrophic bacteria can't do their job of breaking down the organic matter producing CO2. And instead, a different group of methanogenic archaea, they're breaking down that organic matter and producing methane. That methane can diffuse out of the water too, right? Areas of high concentration to low concentration. It can also be oxidized by some bacteria into carbon dioxide. Methane is also not very water soluble. So we see a lot of bubbles. If you've stood on a dock and kind of jumped up and down on the dock and seen bubbles come up from a lake, that's oftentimes methane in those bubbles. And then we also have plants that can act like straws where their roots are in these anoxic zones they can siphon methane from the pore water in the bottom of these lakes and ponds and wetlands and like a straw, vent it to the atmosphere. Now this is really simplified. One way we can complicate it is by saying that the lake is now stratified, this dashed line. Stratification is where we have cold waters on the bottom of a lake and warm water sitting on top of it. So when you like to go swimming in a lake in the summer, you like to swim in the nice warm waters, but you might dive down deep and start to feel those cold waters. That's the thermal stratification. And that happens pretty much all summer in most lakes in this area where we have the warm water sitting on the cold water. That cold water is kind of its own mass and it can build and build with carbon dioxide and methane and get have to, to the point where there's very low oxygen conditions. And then when the lake turns over, it can emit those gases to the atmosphere. And I'm introducing that now because I'm gonna come back to it in a little while. And just for fun, I want to visualize this methane for you because I work a lot with invisible gases and you just like hope that your gases in one container are moving to another container when you transfer them. And so it's kind of fun when we can actually see this and we pulled this up earlier to make this work. Maybe down here, there we are. I have to find my mouse, there it is. All right, so what you're gonna see, oh, I'm gonna try to make this big, is that they are lighting the methane on fire. So methane gets trapped in the ice because the organic matter is getting broken down, but these lakes get covered with ice. When we actually have winter around, this would be happening here if we had good ice on our water bodies. Um, I can do that again for you. And you can see that there's methane in there because there's so much methane that you can, you can light it on fire. So don't try that at home, but there we go. One more time. All right. And so I'm gonna go back. All right. So how do we quantify this? How do we quantify it besides laying it on fire and seeing that it's there? So for these global models, the upscaling for inland waters has largely been done from that bottom up process that I've talked about, right? That we go out to as many lakes and ponds as we possibly can collectively as a scientific community. We measure those greenhouse gases, we publish those numbers, and then we go around and we compile all of that data and we estimate the global distribution of lakes and we extrapolate upwards. So what you can see here, this is a, the kind of two end members that you might have a little pond and a really big lake. And then these are different studies that estimate the number of lakes worldwide using remote sensing. And so you can have on the X axis, the number of lakes in logarithmic scale and on the Y axis, the small lakes up to the really, really big lakes and we can then estimate the surface area of all of those lakes in the world. And we can say, okay, if you're this size of a lake, you emit this much carbon dioxide and methane. Again, a pretty simple way of doing it. Um, so we scale up 
Sometimes we might add in something secondarily. There's recently been some estimates of chlorophyll values in lakes with satellite imagery at a global scale because chlorophyll is a proxy of algal biomass. If you have a really green pea soup lake, you have high chlorophyll. And with remote sensing, we can actually tell the color of lakes. And so there are different ways that we're improving those upscaled models. Um, but basically you go measure it, you estimate how many lakes there are in the world and you make some back of the envelope calculations to extrapolate how much methane or carbon dioxide is coming out of lakes. And th these are some data from my dissertation looking at 427 water bodies around the planet. And we found that there was about 0.58 petagrams of carbon per year coming out of all lakes and ponds and reservoirs on the planet. Most of that was carbon dioxide, 0.57, like 98% of it was, was carbon dioxide. But methane, if we consider how much more of a warming potential it has, we can put things into what's called carbon dioxide equivalences. And it's to measure how much warming potential these different gases have. And because methane is such a potent greenhouse gas, 28% of the warming potential coming off of these lakes is coming from methane. And so you can see here, we have the size classes of the lakes, laser pointer again, so the size class of the lakes, the carbon dioxide fluxes across these different size classes. And one thing I wanna highlight here is the methane flux is much greater in our small water bodies. So the things that you might think of as a pond, they're emitting most of the methane from our inland waters. Now this alone could explain that budgetary imbalance. If you remember that budget imbalance was 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year. And this would more than explain that. So it's suggesting that our land carbon sink may be overestimated. Recently, we've done a synthesis just thinking about methane emissions. And this was for all different aquatic sources from headwater streams to ponds and lakes to coastal habitats to the open ocean. And the big take home message from the synthesis is that half of all global methane emissions in, like fossil fuels included, half of it is coming from wet places on the planet, wetlands, lakes, reservoirs. And so you can see this diagram here, we have the emissions coming from aquatic systems. We did it two different ways. I'm happy to answer questions about it. But however you do it, it's half of what you can do when you add up agriculture and waste, fossil fuels, geologic sources, biomass, right? And another way of looking at that is if you put them in a stacked bar graph, you can see that the aquatic sources that are those colors, they represent half of all of the global methane emissions. So we're talking about globally significant numbers here. And if we think just about lakes, it's nine to 19% of the total estimated methane emissions on the planet. Now, those error bars are really large. We have more work to do to figure out the uncertainty, but we are talking about some pretty big numbers. So what do these new studies mean for carbon dioxide accounting? Well, what we're finding is that with each new study that we do, we're increasing how much carbon dioxide we think is coming off of um, these water bodies. This figure actually includes carbon dioxide and methane to estimate how much carbon has to be coming off the land to account for all of these emissions. And you can see that we're now saying it's not just 1.9 petagrams of carbon coming off of the terrestrial landscape. We're saying it might be five petagrams of carbon coming off the terrestrial landscape and coming into our inland waters. So how do we make sense of this budget? Either our inland water carbon emissions are overestimated, it's way too high, or the land storage is lower than what we think, or perhaps it's a bit of both, okay? So Instead of clarifying the budget, these inland waters are actually complicating the budget a little bit. For methane accounting, these inland waters have higher methane emissions than we previously thought, so it's also complicating the budgets. But we also recognize that our bottom-up numbers are not matching our top-down numbers, so we have to figure this out. Maybe our inland water estimates are too high. I'm going to argue that we need to move from those big extrapolations that I have helped out with in the past to more mechanistic models that account for things like temperature or how much fertilizer is going into our lakes, um, get more spatially explicit with our modeling, which I think is where, where the field is headed. So to summarize this, are inland waters important for the global carbon budgets? Yes, they are. They could explain that CO2 imbalance and more. Lakes and ponds are really important for emitting methane. Um, and most of that methane is coming out of our smaller water bodies rather than our bigger water bodies. But the budget still doesn't balance 
We're about to submit a new global methane budget. The budget still doesn't balance, but we're going in the right direction. Um, and I think that's going to fuel further research in these areas. One of the big areas of research I think we need is understanding the drivers of the greenhouse gases in these inland waters so that we can get better models so that we can make more accurate predictions. And so this is some work that I did with a collaborator at the United States Geological Survey. We use that same data set for that big global methane synthesis from aquatic sources. We use that same data set, but we dove in deep on the lakes and the ponds. And we are looking at the total methane emissions coming from both those bubbles and that ga the gases that are diffusing out of the water. And one of the big findings that we found that to me wasn't a surprise was again that the small water bodies emit more than the big water bodies. So here we have the area, the, si the how big the different water bodies are. And then we have the total methane flux. And we can see that those smaller water bodies emit more methane. These are on log-log scales. So it's actually an exponential relationship. We can see that the smallest size class of lakes make up 37% of the flux when we start thinking about how much surface area these systems comprise on the landscape. And 60% of the methane flux is coming from systems that are less than a hectare in size. Again, showing these small systems are really important. The other variable that we found that was predictive is dissolved organic carbon. So if a system has more dissolved organic carbon, then that increases the methane flux. So if we could get some estimates of dissolved organic carbon concentrations for lakes worldwide or model that, we could potentially improve our methane emissions numbers. For those bubbles, the bubble fluxes were best predicted by chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, again, is that proxy for algal biomass. So more productive systems, systems that have had more nutrients added to them, have more methane coming out as bubbles. So just to highlight a couple of the big take home points from those couple of studies, one is that we really need to do a better job at quantifying bubble emissions. It's tricky. We, we use these inverted funnels and we put the funnels in the water and then we attach either a bottle or a graduated cylinder to it and we let the bubbles accumulate and then we can measure it. It's annoying, you have to go back out to the water body a lot. It's not done at a really wide scale yet, but we're seeing that those methane bubbles can make up almost 100% of a methane budget from a lake or a pond or almost nothing. And it, we're, we need to get much better at our predictive powers for figuring that out because those methane bubbles can be really important. Um, we also need to do a better job at sampling seasonally. A lot of these studies took place in the summer. Summertime temperatures are greater. Those methane ge um, generating archaea, they're temperature sensitive, so they're gonna be more active in the summer. So maybe some of our overestimates are due to the fact that we're sampling in the summer. Um, the small systems are emitting the most, but they're also understudied compared to our medium-sized lakes. And we really need to move towards mechanistic models. Um, so to get there, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of studies that my lab has been doing focused on ponds to understand variability in greenhouse gas emissions. This was a study that um, I led with my former postdoc, Nick, where we worked with collaborators around North America and Europe to sample greenhouse gas concentrations in small ponds as well as shallow lakes. And we wanted to look at variability across time. If we went out to a site multiple different times, would we get the same answer? And then if we took water samples from multiple different locations, would we get the same answer as if we just took one water sample from the center of the, the pond or the lake? And so you can see the distribution of our sites. We had some in, in the Southern hemisphere and all of those ended up having vandalism and we, didn't, we weren't able to get all of the data. They had sensors out there. Um, so it ended up just being kind of a temperate North America and Europe study. I'm just gonna go over the, the main messages. The first is that you, so what you can see here is this is carbon dioxide concentrations from the systems. These are methane emissions from the systems. The dashed line is what you would be if you're in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So these points, we're actually taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pulling it into the pond. These points are all emitting carbon dioxide. And then all of these water bodies are emitting methane. This dashed line is what the equilibrium of the atmosphere would have been. Um, and each of these gray versus white bars is a site. The three dots within each bar, those are the three time points that we went out. 
And then error bars around that, those dots are the spatial replicates within a site. And so what we found was that the variability was greater across time than across space. And the methane variability was highest in our shallower and smaller water bodies than in our bigger and deeper water bodies. And we think that this is likely due to that accumulation of carbon dioxide and methane on the bottom of stratified systems. Remember how I talked about how there's cold, dense waters and then warm waters? Well, in something like Cayuga Lake, that's stratified all summer. And you have those gases building up, but they're not gonna vent out till the fall when the lake turns over. But in ponds, if they're small and shallow enough, they might stratify for a few weeks and then mix and then stratify and then mix. So you can have this much more temporally variable dynamic depending on when you're getting out there. Did the system just mix or is it stratified? So we think that is explaining some of this variability, which led us to want to explore this on an even finer time scale. These are Cornell's experimental ponds. I love them, they're fantastic. And we get to do different manipulations in them and see what happens. And so when I first got here, Nick and I decided that we wanted to look at the seasonal dynamics of these greenhouse gases. So we picked four replicate ponds to work in to see how the greenhouse gas fluxes and concentrations changed through time by sampling the ponds every two weeks uh, from April, shortly after the ice melted, through November when the ice was forming back on the ponds again. And we wanted to see how variable it was through time. And so what you're seeing here is the carbon dioxide fluxes. And you have, when there's no data, that's ice. And then you can see that the carbon dioxide is kind of in equilibrium with the atmosphere. There's no big flux in or out in the spring. And then in the summer, these ponds have a lot of submerged plants in them. And those submerged plants are very productive. They take up a lot of CO2. And the ponds are, the ponds are actually taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then those plants start to die back and the ponds become a source of carbon dioxide in the fall. So we actually see this really dramatic change across the seasons that we think are linked to the productivity of the plants and when the plants are growing versus dying. Methane was pretty much always a source of methane, but there's these big peaks and troughs as we go. It's very spiky. Um, I should say that this, the colored line is the average of the four ponds and the little black lines are the, the each individual pond. But we don't, we were expecting it maybe a little bit more smooth. We think that maybe this variability again is explained by pond mixing dynamics because these ponds will stratify for several weeks and then maybe we have a storm or a big wind event and the pond will mix and release those gases and then it will restratify and they'll build again. So I have a graduate student right now who is experimenting with these ponds. She caused some to mix regularly, others she let stratify and we've been looking at greenhouse gas concentrations um, because this is something that we could potentially upscale. We have a paper that looks at the drivers of mixing and we could potentially model that at a global scale. And then the, the bubbles, the bubbles are a little smoother. They seem to peak late June and then go back down. They're, they're really related to temperature. And if we look at carbon dioxide equivalences in terms of the total emissions coming out of these systems, it's dominated by methane. Methane is by far the, the factor that's driving this warming potential where we have the diffusive in dark orange and the bubbles, the ebullitive in the light orange. And you can see how that changes seasonally and why if you just take summertime, you might overestimate emissions coming from, from water bodies. So I'd argue that we need more of these seasonal studies uh, to quantify emissions and explain the variability that we're seeing in order to inform regional and global carbon budgets and get to the point where we can make some, some more accurate models. All right, so to summarize this research question, right? what are the drivers of greenhouse gas emissions from inland waters? We see things like water body size, dissolved organic carbon, as well as chlorophyll, how productive the system are. All of those things are influencing our emissions. In ponds, we have more variability across time rather than across space that might relate to mixing, highlighting the need for year round data, and also maybe including temperature in our big global models. And the next steps will be to try to make some of these mechanistic process-based models at regional to global scales. All right, so we're gonna go into our last research question, which is how much carbon 
is sequestered in the sediments of these water bodies, right? Because we have this diagram and we can still see that the gas flux is pretty uncertain, but what about this storage term down here? And so this is also work that Nick and I have been working on at a global scale to model what's, what's going on. And so to provide some background, these are annual carbon burial estimates for lakes that have gone from kind of just statistical extrapolations in the 80s to the 2000s, up to some that have started to include things like phosphorus or nitrogen application so that lakes that are in agricultural areas are modeled to bury more carbon. And so you can see that as the studies have gone on, we're estimating more carbon has been buried in the sediments of these lakes uh, with a lot of uncertainty. For reservoirs, our numbers have actually been going down. These were just kind of back of the envelope calculations in the 80s. And the most recent estimate is much lower for how much carbon are being stored in reservoirs. Wetlands are kind of in between the two, although there is even more uncertainty here because another study that wouldn't even fit on my y-axis here would be 0.8 petagrams and our y-axis goes to 0.2. So there's definitely uncertainty in our freshwater wetlands. But all of these numbers are on the same scale as oceans, how much carbon is accumulated in our oceans each year, and how much carbon is being accumulated in coastal areas called blue carbon. And you've probably heard about blue carbon. I think they've got like a great PR strategy and campaign because you never hear about inland water carbon storage. You always hear about wetlands or about coastal areas. But these inland waters may be storing just as much carbon, if not more. Uh, so this work is the, I'd argue, going to be the best in terms of what we have so far, in terms of a process-based model predicting what carbon burial rates are. So we've compiled 800, or data from 808 natural lakes and ponds, 95 constructed impoundments, so that might be a farm pond or it might be a big reservoir, uh, 147 wetlands. The wetland data for, for freshwater wetlands is lacking, unfortunately. Um, and we're assessing organic carbon burial rates. So what you have here is the global map showing the distribution of all the sites that, we've, that we have now in our data set. What you have on the y-axis here is these different biomes because we're seeing differences if a water body is located in the agricultural Midwest of the United States versus in a temperate forest biome. And now we've been looking at what are the drivers of carbon burial, just like we were thinking about what are the drivers of methane emissions, we're thinking about what are the drivers of carbon burial rates. And we have on this figure, we have lakes and impoundments. If a relationship is significant for lakes, it's a solid line. If a relationship is significant for reservoirs, it's a dashed line. We have lake area, latitude, elevation, um, maximum depth and mean depth, fertilizer use in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus in the region where that lake is or that pond is or that reservoir is, mean annual temperature and annual precipitation also for those regions. So it's not necessarily what the lake experiences right at a local level, but it's these global models and projections of, of what's happening in those regions. And so we found that the lake burial rates increase if you're a small shallow system. So the small shallow systems that are big methane emitters are also big stores of carbon. We also see that lakes and reservoirs store more carbon at low elevations than high elevations. Both lakes and reservoirs store more carbon in areas where nitrogen and phosphorus inputs are higher because that increases the productivity of the system. If you increase the productivity of the system, you have a lot more algae and plants dying, decomposing, settling out to the bottom and getting buried in the sediments. And we also see for lakes that as we increase temperature and as we increase precipitation, we have increased burial rates. And so we are now in the point where we're upscaling this. We're using these models to predict the total amount of carbon stored in lakes. And it's very preliminary, this is not published work, but our numbers are lower than the most recent estimates. And I think in part that's because we're including temperature and not everywhere is really warm and not everywhere that we have studied is indicative of what the global dynamics are where lakes are located around the world. There's a lot of lakes in northern temper or north northern temperate and boreal landscapes that are going to have lower carbon burial rates because they're very cold. 
Um, we still need to get down to what's happening at the, at the level of our small lakes and ponds because this is a spatially explicit model and we only have spatially explicit data for where lakes are located if they are greater than 0.1 square kilometers. Most of our lakes are much smaller than that. So our back of the envelope calculations that we have published suggests that ponds have uh, systems that are small, have higher carbon burial, um, total carbon burial rates than all those big lakes. So that purple is what we would have to add on top of that. Um, so our numbers get higher again for these systems that haven't been included in the budgets in the past. Um, we're still working on how to model those and put, put them in with things like temperature and elevation and all the driving variables. So that's to come yet. For reservoirs, our numbers are even lower than the last one. So again, we're showing this declining estimate of how much reservoirs, so these impoundments, can store. Um, and so we're still... We're still kind of wrapping our head around that. We again think it probably has to do with the biome and the temperature that our models are including that others haven't. We're also doing the same thing for wetlands. We aren't there yet with our global, our global models. We're still trying to figure out which wetland maps to use and comparing some different wetland maps. But if we look at the drivers, we can see that uh, wetlands at low elevation store more carbon, same as our lakes and reservoirs. And if we increase our fertilizer inputs to wetlands, both nitrogen and phosphorus, we increase our carbon burial again because we're increasing the productivity of the plants that die and get built upon and, and form those sediments that are getting sequestered. And if we increase temperature, we increase those burial rates as well. And so our next steps are to make some models that are spatially explicit for these, these wetlands. Um, so you got some, some preliminary data there. So summarizing this research question, right? How much carbon is sequestered in lake and wetland sediments? Well, we are seeing that our small systems have much higher carbon burial than our big systems. We're seeing linkages with things like water body size and depth, fertilizer inputs, temperature inputs, or temperature increases, and that these mechanistic models may be really important to getting better constraints on these global numbers that are important for our budgets. Okay, so I'm wrapping up. Um, now that I have a captive audience, if this is exciting for you, we are hiring. So that's the info you'll get in the slides later, but that's the link on Workday. You have till Friday to apply. And with that, I'm gonna conclude. Hopefully I've convinced you that inland waters are really important to carbon dioxide and methane budgets, despite the fact that they were not included in these global models uh, until 2007. They may help explain the carbon dioxide budget imbalance. I think another key factor here that I have shown you is that we expect emissions to rise if we increase nutrients, if we increase carbon inputs, and we continue to warm our waters, right? So that's a, a positive feedback loop that could exacerbate emissions. Inland waters are also important for carbon sequestration, but our math right now makes it look like the amount of carbon that's being buried in wetlands and water bodies is not offsetting how much methane is being produced. Um, and a lot of our work focuses on these small water bodies. So I have to focus on the fact that these small water bodies, these ponds are major players in the greenhouse gas budget, both for emissions and storage. And I really can't drive home the fact enough that we need some better models. And I think we're getting to that point where we can make mechanistic models by using the drivers that are influencing emissions, influencing carbon storage to better bound these numbers at both regional and national and global scales. So with that, this is not work that I could have done by myself. I have an awesome team, both the global methane budget and these regionalized carbon budgets, a variety of folks and a really awesome team here at Cornell. I know I highlighted a lot of Nick's work, but the whole team is doing really cool work related to greenhouse gases and carbon budgets and waters um, and a lot of funders to help support the work. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Oh, you have to wait for the microphones, right? Yes, it'll, I'll bring the microphone around again. And I'll note that there's, a, on the last section of Canvas, some of you may have found it, but there's a, 
um, extras section for things like um, clubs and job opportunities. And if you give oh. me a copy of your ad, I will post this in that Perfect. opportunity for um, undergrads to apply. Okay, okay. so I'm busting over here somewhere. Eric. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, we'll go there and then there and there. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Professor Hogstern, and it's really nice to see you outside of uh, the 1610 class again as well. Uh, my question is about, like, is there any kind of like potential solutions or artificial intervention that we can do on this, in, like, water bodies to reduce their um, greenhouse gas emissions so far? Although, like, as you mentioned, like, we are still at the stage of, like, getting better models for this. Yeah. So I think one important point in thinking about, like, what can we do about this it's considering what's on the natural side of the budget that we just need to make sure we have good numbers on so our models are correct. And then what's on the anthropogenic side of things that's kind of on us because we have increased these emissions. Uh, and so like when we add nitrogen and phosphorus to our water bodies, we are increasing those emissions. So this is a big area of discussion for this global methane budget that will be coming out uh, because we wanted to provide like an estimate of what should go on the natural side of the budget and what should go on the anthropogenic side of the budget. And ultimately, we kind of circled around this number of about a third, about a third of our emissions coming from our natural lakes and ponds and streams and rivers are anthropogenic. That was a huge debate. And like, we don't have great rationale for why we picked a third. There's a little bit of data here and there. Um, but we, were, we thought it was important to emphasize that for the first time in a global budget because people are saying, oh, well, that's just the natural side of the budget. We just need that for the models. We are not responsible for reducing emissions there. So if we want to reduce emissions from these water bodies, the biggest thing that we need to do is first stop emitting fossil fuels and stop the temperatures from rising. But then we need to stop putting so much nitrogen and phosphorus into our water bodies. But the second side of that is the anthropogenic side of things. We have constructed reservoirs all over the world by damming up our streams. And we're also really good at creating farm ponds all over the landscape. The state of New York is subsidizing the creation of farm ponds for climate resiliency so that farmers have water in times of drought, which is a really important thing to do. But those are all on the anthropogenic side of things. And so our lab is currently trying to figure out, are there ways to reduce emissions from those human managed systems already? So if you have a farm pond in your backyard, could you put a solar powered aerator out there, increase oxygen concentrations throughout the whole water column and reduce your methane emissions? So that's something that our lab was testing out this past summer. Yeah. So um, my question is, is about the bottom up and top down. I know that the results have been different, but have you seen them start to converge like o over the years as science has gotten better or have they still just been like really different? So this new global methane budget, the difference is, is it's getting closer. So we're doing a little bit better of a job. A couple of the reasons for that are some of these modeling approaches are getting better. One thing that used to happen is we would just multiply numbers by 365 and say, what we, ha what we have from our data, we'll just multiply that by all the days of the year. Well, I don't think I added that as a supplemental figure, but one of our regional estimates put in ice cover. And so we know that many of these lakes and streams have ice on them, or they did. I'm very disappointed by this year's winter, but have ice cover. And that's basically a block. It keeps those emissions from, from coming out, unless you light them on fire, or they might come out when the ice melts in the spring. So we added an ice cover correction. And then we also added that some of that will be emitted in the spring when the ice melts. And so that reduced how much emissions we think are coming out of these water bodies by doing that. Well, as we add temperature into these models, we can, I think, reduce those emissions still a little bit more. So I think we're moving in the right direction for sure. But it's, yeah, it's still not balanced. Um, how do increasing like droughts or um, rainfall affect carbon emissions from ponds? Yeah. So as you can see with our estimates for carbon burial, we're seeing that if we increase precipitation, we increase burial rates. We're probably also increasing our greenhouse gas emissions. And that's partly because as it rains, we have more carbon coming into the system that can then get broken down by microbes um, and emitted or stored. But what we're seeing is we're not just seeing like more sprinkling rain events, we're seeing more intense storms in many areas. And those more intense storms cause more erosion, cause more things to come into our lakes and that can increase emissions. So precipitation is kind of tricky and it's also very regional with predictions if we're gonna get more, if we're gonna get less. Um, changing water levels, like we've seen this in, in reservoirs where there's a water control structure and they can lower the, 
the reservoir lower the water levels, those um, drawdowns and reflooding events can release a lot of methane sometimes. Um, so there is a little bit of, of that at play, but unfortunately it's a little complicated and it's probably regional specific. Yeah, good question. Hi, <clears throat> so one of my research interests is atmospheric interactions with the environment and ecosystems. So I'm just wondering if you, you um, did any research or know anything about how like the increased carbon dioxide like concentrations and like carbon storage in the lakes and um, the wetlands have like how, how are they affecting the ecosystems and the environment? Yeah. So like, what are the actual consequences that like in the ocean, when you increase CO2, yeah, how you're is causing it acidification? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, there's some evidence and some suggestion that as we increase CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, the wetland plants might grow better because they have more carbon dioxide. Um, I think that's that in the terrestrial world, that's, there is some evidence of that. And there's also some counter evidence to that. Um, that's a really great question. In, in terms of methane, methane is sort of a, a byproduct of having anoxic conditions. Those anoxic conditions can be kind of challenging for some organisms that live there, but it's not, a, it's not the methane that's the problem. It's that there's low oxygen environments. Um, but with climate change, we're going to have more and more lakes with those anoxic bottoms. And there's some research by Pete McIntyre's group here at Cornell and, and DNRE that's suggesting that in the Adirondacks, as those lakes warm, their bottoms will become more anoxic. They'll lose that oxygen. The tops will become warmer. And things like trout that require cold waters, those trout are not going to have the habitat that they need. So it's a, it's a little anecdotal the, from your question on directly what are the effects of CO2 and methane. But some of the factors that affect CO2 and methane are affecting the organisms. Yeah. Um, you had talked about it a little bit with the droughts, but has there been a lot of like research into regions where there's a lot of like either dry season or a wet season or like where they purposely have a pond and then get rid of all the water, like in Louisiana when they do crawfish, like farming, like fill up a huge reservoir and then they just get rid of it later in the season. Yeah. Has there been a lot of like research into like those effects of having a huge pond and then it just completely disappearing? There has not been as much research as I would like to see on that, but there is a group called Dry Flux. And they're a group of scientists that study water and they're specifically asking as water bodies dry up, what are emissions looking like? Um, and it kind of depends on how saturated those sediments remain when the, when, the wa when the water column over it disappears. If the sediment dries out, then that pretty much stops methane from being emitted and it switches to carbon dioxide that's emitted. And carbon dioxide, we'd rather have carbon dioxide be emitted than methane because of the warming potential. Uh, but if the sediments stay really wet and mucky, that's still really great for methane emissions. Um, and so they compared a lot of different water body types that were drying down. And they found that for most, they emitted less when they were drying, except for ponds, which for some reason emitted more. Um, and so I think there's still more research to be done on that, but that's a, a really good point. There's a question over here, right there, and then there, and then I'm running back over the other side. Okay. So I had a question about like wetlands specifically. I know in a bunch of my classes for ENS, we talk about how bogs and swamps and all of those, they're super important for the environment um, because they take the new excess nutrients, they put it back in the soil, everything like that. Um, so hearing this side of ponds and lakes is something that I'm not used to because I'm used to thinking of them as like the superheroes of the environment. Um, so I just had a question on bogs and wetlands because there are anoxic conditions. We see bubbles all the time in those situ like situations and places. Um, overall, is there um, addition to greenhouse gases? Does that balance out their like helpfulness in terms of nutrient sequestration or not? Such a good question. You're not alone in that thinking. And I, I hate being the bearer of bad news. But in most cases, the methane that's being emitted on an annual basis is greater than what's being sequestered. Yep. That being said, wetlands and these lakes have stored so much carbon for so many centuries that if we were to, say, drain them, 
and we'd release all this carbon, that would be catastrophic for the planet. There was a paper that came out last year that was like, stop restoring wetlands for carbon, right? Lots of reasons to restore wetlands. Many, many, many reasons we should restore the wetlands. Not necessarily for carbon. It was saying that it's gonna take hundreds of years for it to become more carbon beneficial than the emissions. Um, and so the important thing right now is to preserve the intact wetlands and make sure that carbon stays in the ground. But yeah, there's a lot of methane that, that comes out of these systems. Fresh water. Yes, fresh water. Coastal systems don't emit as much methane because of sulfate in the sediments. I'm new to um, thinking about this stuff in the context of freshwater systems. I grew up in a coastal area, and I'm curious if in your study systems you monitor pH and whether something akin to ocean acidification happens in freshwater bodies. Yes, so we do measure pH. One of the challenging things is that in those anoxic zones, the pH is really low because the carbon dioxide concentrations are really high. So wetlands are typically acidic. Uh, the bottoms of lakes are pretty acidic. There is a big difference in pH between the bottom waters and the top waters because of concentration differences in carbon dioxide. Um, there's also carbonate buffering. I don't want to get into all of the chemistry, but in lakes, um, if there's a lot of limestone and carbonate that's available to so it can buffer the pH, but other systems with like more granite geology, like the Adirondacks, they don't have that same buffering capacity. And so when there was acid rain, those systems really got acidic. Um, and so it's a little different than the ocean. Happy to chat more about it with you, but there's in general, not the same concern, but with acid rain, there was a big concern based off of how much systems can kind of buffer themselves from changes in pH. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, although you had mentioned that uh, you were unable to collect data in the Southern Hemisphere, how might you expect that data to differ from the data that you collected in the Northern Hemisphere? And how do you think their response to climate change would also be different? Such a great question. So the first thing is that the distribution of lakes worldwide are really focused in the Northern Hemisphere, like Russia, Canada, they have the most number of lakes. And that number goes way down when you get into tropical zones. But those areas also create a lot of ponds and a lot of reservoirs. Um, and so the temperature dynamic is huge because those are much warmer places. And if you increase temperature, you're gonna increase the production of methane, the production of carbon dioxide. Uh, so those emissions are going to be greater even though there's fewer of them on the landscape. I think as I talked about like the water column mixing I think is really important. And those systems can have very different mixing dynamics because they can be warm all year long. They don't necessarily have the spring and the fall mixing that we have when our temperatures drop. Uh, and so I was really bummed that I think it was three different research teams that were gonna contribute mixing data to our data set. All of them, those temperature loggers <laughs> broke or taken. Um, so I, I do think that's a still a really important research area is to get more data on the mixing dynamics and then how those mixing dynamics influence the emissions for those especially created ponds in those regions. Yeah, good question. Okay, hands high. Okay. So many questions, so good. And then three, and that's as far as I can count. Okay, <laughs> for now. Um, thank you. Uh, would making the fresh bodies of water deeper increase uh, carbon storage while not necessarily increasing methane emission? Yes, so that's something that we are looking at with the data set we collected this past summer from all of these artificial ponds that are in residential or farmland, people's backyards, to see if that depth um, matters. Because if you have a deeper system, it should be more stratified and there should be fewer of those ups and down like cycles of the methane kind of being burped out. Uh, and that would be kind of an easy thing. Like the state is like, well, if we're going to subsidize the creation of farm ponds, like let us know if there's a certain size or depth that we should tell people to make them. So we're looking at that. The data in terms of lakes and lake carbon burial, the jury's a little out still on how depth and then the strength of the stratification will change with climate because those bottom waters will stay cold. And if it's colder, there's less microbes breaking things down. Maybe carbon storage will increase. Uh, 
but there's also data that's showing that the bottoms of the lakes, their temperatures aren't changing as much as the tops of lakes. So I think the jury's still out a little bit on how that's gonna influence carbon burial, but there should definitely be an effect on how much of that methane eventually gets out. Yeah. Um, I've been noticing a lot more like plants and seaweed, not seaweed, but like lake weeds in local ponds. I live in upstate New York, so in this area, is that like creating more problems because they're decomposing and then emitting things? Such a good question. The macrophytes, that's what we call these like aquatic plants, has been a new area of research in my lab that's been really fun. One of the things that we're finding is when the stands of macrophytes are really dense, the tops of those plants are really healthy, but the bottom of those plants are shaded. They're being like, they're either self-shading or their neighbors are shading them. And so we have a lot of decomposition in the, wa the bottom waters where those plants are growing if they're really dense. And that produces a lot of methane. It draws the oxygen down because of the decomposition. It creates a lot of methane. It also enhances stratification. So those bottom waters can get really rich in methane, really low in oxygen. Uh, and we are seeing that there are more of these like water weeds. We're talking with landowners and they're seeing this. And so we don't have the data to show this increase over time, but there's anecdotal evidence of it. We have a survey out right now with private landowners asking them about how they perceive pond water quality, how they perceive their pond's health, what concerns they have. And some of the preliminary numbers is overarching that they're concerned about more water weeds growing in their ponds. Um, and those definitely can influence this biogeochemistry. Yeah, lost track of the next, was it here? Hold hand high if I pointed at you previously. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then here. Hi. Um, yeah, so I have a bit of a modeling question. So I know in mechanistic modeling, you have to make assumptions just for the sake of simplicity, yeah. because models can get insane. With with something as sensitive and like time intensive, like we don't have a lot of time to figure out like what the carbon budgets are and how we can kind of offset carbon emissions from different parts of the cycle. How do you how, how does your lab or like in general because I'm not really familiar with um, like climate change modeling, but how do you account for these assumptions that could be catastrophic if you make the wrong one? Yeah, so we're just kind of diving into these big global models too. Usually I'm like one of many contributors in, in thinking about it. Um, but some things you can do are sensitivity analyses where you're like, okay, let me change this one knob. Let me turn it up or let me turn it down. And then let's see how big an effect that has on my final numbers. And so we're doing some of, of that um, with it. Uh, I think that's probably the, the best answer that I can kind of give you broadly thinking, but I, I do think it's hard to put in too many parameters into a model, but what we've been doing historically has just sort of been these extrapolations rather than trying to get at all of these different variables. And so we're kind of maybe in the happy medium spot right now, but there's a lot of labs that are working on making these models better. Yeah. So my question is sort of the opposite of the one that was asked about water weeds. And it's that I'm wondering if you've noticed an effect on methane production in lakes from invasive species that eat plant life. Uh, I guess, for example, I have family up in Canada and they live on a lake and basically all the plant life in that lake has been completely devastated by a species of invasive snail. And I'm wondering if you've seen sort of impacts from things like that. Yeah, so one of the studies that we're writing up right now was looking at what happens if you add a bass to, a, to ponds and then you kind of induce this trophic cascade downwards. And there has been a little bit of research on that because there's what's called the, the things that convert methane to carbon dioxide are methane oxidizing bacteria. And they are in the water column and zooplankton can graze on them. And so if we increase our population of zooplankton, then they can eat more of those methane oxidizing bacteria and then more methane can be emitted. And so that's typically the pathway that people are trying to look at it. Like, is it affecting those zooplankton grazers? In which case it would be influencing those microbes, in which case we're then influencing that methane. I haven't seen the research on what happens if you just like devegetate your system. Although this year we do have ponds that we sampled that had no submerged plants and others that had so much submerged plants that the bottoms were anoxic. So we might be able to start getting at that in the density of the plants. I think that'll be you know, probably more important in our shallow systems where those plants are a big part of the ecosystem versus big deep lakes where plankton is the dominant part of the, the food web. But yeah, I, I think those are important questions to ask. Yeah. 
I have a question about like the accounting problem when it comes to methane and carbon cycling. It was more, it's more of like a research question. Although like you said that there are larger discrepancies, there are large discrepancies for both wetlands and inlands and mm. even greater accounting problem for methane than CO2. But I was wondering what smaller things can be done to try to research these like um, emissions or like what can be done on a bigger scale that hasn't been done yet yes. is like my question. Yes. So for the methane, I think part of it is that the inland waters are probably a little bit overestimated. And part of that is what we've talked about, like the seasonality and the temperature and the mechanistic models. But there's also some debate in those methane budgets about the other components. So there's a big debate over how much geological methane is coming out of the planet. And some people, including like Bob Howarth here at Cornell, argues that that number is way overestimated and it should be much lower, which actually gives some room to take from that pot and put it into the inland water pot. Um, the same has been argued for termites. Uh, and then the fossil fuel number might be too low. And so in that case, we need to increase that. So I, I think all of the, the research areas are active and it's all these different groups that are doing it. Part of it might be coming together and being like, oh, can I take some of yours? And can you take some of my beans uh, for the counting? But in general, I think we're moving in the right direction that like researchers are trying to figure this out on all fronts. Um, it's just, I think the inland water for some reason we're a little bit behind in terms of getting it into the budget. Yeah. Well, very big, very difficult study. So let's mm -hmm. thank Professor Holgerson one more time. Thank you very much.